I know. Sylvia, Sylvia, and I are very excited for this class. We have extra, extra special guests here today in Professor Chuck Sandy. Tatiana's here from Russia. Lonely Lion is Chinese. Are you in China? Uh, what else do we have here? We have Vladimiras here from Slovakia. We have Olga from Mexico. It's going fast now. So, oh, Dr. Nelly Deutsch is back in New Jersey. No, I think she means I'm back in New Jersey. Yes, back in New Jersey. We have Tunisia, Yemen, Argentina, more Mexico, more Yemen, New York City. Woohoo, Julie. I'm 12 miles west. East Coast represent the best. Hands moving too fast. Okay, no, no hands moving. Dr. Nelly, are you going to do this to me again today? No. They love my hands moving. Or so they say. More people from Russia here. Andreas here from Russia. <laughs> I am very, I'm excited, as you know, in general. But I'm very excited, as I think you know, about ELT techniques. So today, I am extra, especially crazily excited because I'm welcoming... Uh, a man, a teacher who uh, I look up to very much and with whom I hope to be working more in the future. And well, we're starting here. And uh, he's someone that I've learned, uh, as I just said, I've learned a lot from, but not just about uh, being an English teacher from the, the books he's written and the, the webinars he's given, but also his commitment. He calls himself uh, an education activist, and when I saw that, I was like, hmm, I kind of like the sound of that. Uh, this is a guy who walks the walk as far as when he's trying to get uh, schools all over the world, no matter how small, no matter how poor uh, the areas. He's really working very hard with this wonderful organization, uh, ITDI. Uh, you may have heard of it. If not, you'll hear about it today And as teacher trainers. And, uh, and not just that, but that's that's the, the main idea, what they're doing, uh, bringing teacher training and development where uh, people don't don't have it uh, as, as much. And yes, Chuck Sandy is amazing. And Sylvia's interviewing Chuck. Very cool. So uh, I told him to wait a second so we could gather here and then he'll be in here. <laughs> yes. I'm energetic as usual. I hope I don't. I hope I don't turn people off with with too much energy. I know I can get a little crazy. Uh, and is Chuck here? And I just can't see him. Is that what's going on? Maybe there's something. I'm here. Oh, he is here. <laughs> You're I'm here. Second, yeah, I'm having. It's it's my issue. Can everybody see Chuck? I can hear him. Hey, I can see. Him. Good. Uh, let's just thumbs up or clap or yes or something to let us know uh, you can see. Mr. Chuck Sandy from ITDI. Yes, yes, yes. Here I am. <laughs> Here he is. And uh, Chuck, I, I just told a, a little bit about you and um, uh, how impressed I am by your work and how excited I am to have you here. Uh, Sylvia and others also are really excited to, that you're, you're, being, you're part of this move. So we're really honored to have you here. And I'm work, honored. I'm honored to be here. The work you're doing at ITDI. Amazing. And the work we're, we're, I'm trying to do, I'm just, I, I really look up to you. So I, I'm really excited that we're, we're working Same here. in this way. Wow. Me too. Uh, but I, I haven't told them anything really specific, including where you are right now, where you've been, uh, your travels, your background, anything. So I, I'm sure people I'm are interested. I'm sitting in my room in rural middle of nowhere, Japan. I just got back from a month in Thailand and yeah. <laughs> I've been around. And he's doing wonderful work. Uh, what I'm going to do, Chuck, uh, because Chuck's been in Thailand and offline, so he, he hasn't had the chance to catch up with all the great classes we've had here. But what I'm going to do, Chuck, is I'm going to exit stage left, but I can come back in at any point. You can just summon me. So uh, I, I, I just I just yell I just yell your name and you come. Yeah, isn't that cool? Uh, Jays. <laughs> I'll be here, man. I'll be here. Uh, so yeah, I'll just stop broadcasting my video and audio, but I can come back in and um, take it away, Chuck Sandy. Okay. Can everybody see me and hear me? With a th can you give me a big thumbs up there? You good? Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm sitting here in my room in rural Japan, as I said, and I'm just thrilled to be here and thrilled to be invited and thrilled to be part of this amazing ELTT MOOC and 
is just really exciting. And my, my talk tonight is going to be about uh, projects. It's something I've been really involved in, in over the years. How many people out there do projects of any kind with your students? I see some love, a couple of people love projects. Yeah, if you want, you can just type in the, the chat window, the kind of projects you do. That's right, my talk tonight is going to be about projects, simple projects. Because despite the fact that we're here in an amazing online world in the cloud, I really am a pencil and paper kind of old school tech 0, 0.0 kind of guy. And that's where most of my projects start. And uh, I'm going to show you a classroom here if I can remember how to do this. There we go. Simple as that. The lady down in the corner of the picture is my grandmother. That's my grandmother, Pearl Sandy, who is my inspiration for becoming a teacher. And uh, she, this is her classroom. A classroom from 100 years. <laughs> she looks familiar, says Dr. Nelly. 100 years ago. And the interesting thing is that a lot of the things that she was doing in her classroom back then, 100 years ago, are, are things that I'm still doing now and that a lot of us are, are, are still doing. My grandmother was a dogma teacher before the, the word even existed because she taught using the materials that were available and, and she taught using what's there. Taught with a lot of heart. So, teach in a classroom in 2013 that's not that different from the one that my grandmother taught in almost 100 years ago. She taught her lessons in a one-room schoolhouse equipped with slate boards, not quite enough chalk and uncomfortable seating. The room I've been working in has chalkboards, not quite enough chalk and uncomfortable seating. Some similarities. And I do not have to fire up a wood stove in the morning the way that she did, but my room is always either too hot or too cold. My grandmother had a radio to sort of bring the world into her classroom. I had a TV monitor with a DVD player and a projector connected to a sound system. My grandmother told me that she only played the radio in class to provide atmosphere. I often did the same thing with the songs I stored on my Apple computer, only less effectively because at least the radio in my grandmother's classroom provided an ever-changing mix of music punctuated by talk from somewhere far away. I had never played a DVD in class. I do not have internet access in my class one, or if I do, it's just too complicated to figure out how to mother did not need to think about such things. In both of our rooms, almost 100 years apart, an amazing assortment of people with the usual assortment of issues, ideas, dreams, and goals have gathered to work their way into the future. There's nothing different, really, the work she did then and the work I do now and the work you do now. We are teachers, which is to say, the work she did and the work we do is a combination of dream weaving and storytelling mixed with community building and acts of pure magic. My grandmother's magic trick was to get the farm kids in her class to believe they could do anything. I do exactly the same thing with kids who are not that different. Her students in 1909 felt invisible and powerless. So do mine. My grandmother did her trick with her heart. I use my heart as well as all of you do, but we have a few magical tools at our disposal to make it all seem dreamlike. There. Pearl Sandy, grandmother, would love that magic. And so, in her honor, I help my students unpack and unleash that power. 
Recently, we've been working on telling stories in my classroom, making use of the blackboards, some paper, a lot of ideas in each other. This is a storyboard from uh, my blackboard in class. I, the picture wasn't very good, so I did a little magic with it. But you can see, really, it's just some chalk and some lines and some ideas up there. And it's something my grandmother could have done on a slate board. So making use of blackboards and papers, a lot of ideas in each other. And one day, when the room got too hot, we just went outside and told our stories under a shady tree. This is a picture from 2012, but you know, it really could from 1909, except for the color, really. All of these activities so far are ones that I'm sure my grandmother did with her students. Here's where things get very different. I gathered my students together and said, how many of you have a smartphone in your pocket? 18 out of 24 had one that could record video. Six out of 18 had enough battery and memory left to record videos of their classmates telling we broke into groups of four with one filmmaker in each group. And we videoed our stories and loaded them onto our private class Facebook page. And then we started critiquing them and sharing them. And that's the magic. And that's the real revolution. So, you know, there are still people who ask the question, should we use technology? And it's just a silly question. The real question is, how can we use the magic available to us to give voice to everyone and get the world connected in real and wonderful ways? That's Shiho. She's one of my students. And uh, she's telling a story there. It's a story that we're just filming on somebody's iPhone and sharing it with each other and then later with the world. Well, the students in my grandmother's class are now silent. My students never will be, or either will yours. Our students are not isolated in a room in the middle of nowhere. Their voices carry and will be heard everywhere, just the way yours are. And this is, this is the magic that's happening today. Teaching itself is not that very isolated doing things in little rooms alone where our voices are not carrying out. Now we're connected. And that in itself is just an incredible thing. So what does all this have to do with pronunciation and listening? Well, I am a firm believer in the fact that everything holds together and that any skill we teach is helping other skills develop. And that when we begin by getting people to read and write and think and create and talk and listen and all of these things work together. And I don't have the research to show you, but you can look it up because it's out there. But, you know, you cannot say what you can't hear. You can't read what you can't understand yet, but you're not ready to process. And the more you read, the better your pronunciation gets. It's really interesting. The more you write, the more you get to say the things that you want to say, the better it all gets and hangs together. So we start in my classes with these little projects that begin with blackboards and pieces of paper and markers. And it's completely education 0.0. .0. There's nothing tech about it. And you notice in my classroom that we have blackboards. We sit in rooms full of markers and we just create stuff. And the projects that they all begin usually with some vague idea I have. And I go into class and I ask students, you know, how, how do you think this would work? What, what, what can we do? How can we put this together? And then they start to share. And they come we do some things that doesn't go that far, but it's just kind of interesting. This was a little haiku project we did one day because I was just we were thinking about haiku and somebody mentioned a poem, and we all created haiku, 
And we wrote them on cards, we took pictures of each other, we put it up on my Facebook page and their Facebook pages, and we shared them in some other places, and it's magic. And this is just, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I would have done this in class anyway. But there's just something so powerful about being able to share, to read these out loud and getting other people to see what's happening. And it's right, all you need is a camera. All you need is a camera to do this. That's it. Haiku, that's right, is Japanese poetry. Five syllables, seven, five syllables. Her haiku there is, it is rainy day. Children put on a raincoat and jump in the puddles. It's not a brilliant, brilliant haiku, but it's right there. And the five, seven, five syllables structure is there as well. And look how happy she is just doing that. <sighs> So we start here. We start here basically from nothing. And sometimes some of my colleagues used to think that I just go into class naked without an idea in my head, but it's not really true at all. We start with an idea. We start with just something, something very small. And here we just came in. I just came into class and I asked my students, what are you interested in talking about today? What are some topics that you'd like to explore? And we started doing that. We started talking about these things. And pretty soon we've got this messy blackboard. You know, you can almost smell the chalk in this room. And I want to just back up a little bit and, and say that in the classes I've seen around the world, they're a lot like mine. They're a lot like grandmothers. Most of them I've been to in uh, Southeast Asia recently. In the past year or so, they're not connected to the internet. They don't have reactive whiteboards. There's not much really going on there. I mean, well, no, let me rephrase this. There's a lot going on there, but there's not a connection to the world really. But yes, that's right, Dr. Nelly. They have smartphones. They have the world in their pocket. But you see here, we're offering, I'm offering students a lot of choices. What can we do? We want to do a presentation, a podcast, a video, a report. You want to create a song. You want to do a drama. There's lots of different ways we can work on this. So my students came up. They worked in groups. They said, well, you know, we could create surveys. We could write interview questions. We could create a storyboard. We could make PowerPoint slides. Some people did some things. Some people did other things. And then eventually we decided on something else. So still, here we are with a blackboard, just a blackboard. And we had an idea. We're going to work in groups. Each of the groups chose a topic, just a topic. Some people started with sports. Some people started with fashion. Some people started with food. You know, very generic topics. And we just started, somehow this grammar came up. We started working on it. And we started building with it. And it, all just it all it's almost mechanical at this point as you can see and some of the things that people were coming up with on the board how important is it for you to laugh how important is it for you to spend to spend time with your family how important is part-time job for you how important are friends for you these are i mean these are the questions that they're starting to build that they're going to use for surveys yeah something like clt i guess but you can see there's a lot of grammar work going on. And students, of course, are walking around asking each other these questions. They're creating, they're creating, they're, they're doing pair work and group work, and they're listening, they're speaking, they're already working on pronunciation here, right? And, you know, the focus right here really, on, on some level in the back of my head, is I want to make sure that this language is right because this is an important structure. But I'm not telling them that. I'm not going to tell them in a million years that we're working on grammar. No, we're working on something far more important than that. Eventually, we get to Survey Monkey, which I'm sure all of you know. And if you don't, you certainly should. It's an absolutely free. Three. 
That seemed like, well, Google survey forms work great too. I prefer Sur SurveyMonkey for a couple of reasons. And one is because they're limited. 10 questions, that's all you get. And I, li I like this fact. And I like the fact that it's very constrained because it helps my students focus in on particular areas. Google survey forms have real benefits as well. But for my students, low my pretty much low level students, these forms work pretty, pretty well for them. And the first time they get up there, they got their questions, they've been working for a while, they sit in groups and work, and they, they send it out to the world. And I, I help them send them out. You know, I use my own Facebook network, my own Twitter network to share, help share. They share on their own Facebook pages, but somehow, you know, I have more connections than they do. And it's really interesting what happens. They get the results back and they find out that the questions don't work. They don't get the information that they thought they were going to get. And so then it's time to step back and really think about, well, why? Why did someone answer the question? How did you get this data? How did this come up for you? And a lot of critical thinking needs to be placed. This, this group of guys here were just absolutely great. They worked together. They tried to figure things out. And before we were through with this project, they had done probably five versions uh, of their survey. And this in itself was a very, very interesting process. And every time they put their, their survey up onto SurveyMonkey and we shared it, they get results back, they'd also get some feedback often from other teachers and other students around the world about their survey and what was good about it and what was bad about it. And this really, really helped them think things through. And this right here is critical thinking, but you can also see there's, there's, there's listening here. There's speaking here, there's reading, there's writing, there's everything going on, all of the same. So back to language again, you know? The next thing we had to do with this is to really think about how to present, how can we present this information? And, you know, some language needs to be worked on again, you know, surprisingly, not surprisingly, what, what was interesting about the results that came up? But again, we're, we're working on language, but we're not talking about language. We're just talking about how to present. You can see some graphs on the, on the board. Again, we're still except for that foray into SurveyMonkey, a little bit into social media, it's still all paper, pencil, blackboard thinking, and that's it. But everybody's feeling like there's something interesting going on, and they feel like they're learning, and they're happy. See how happy they are? They're happy. And then we got to do some more things to the Blackboard and working groups. And if you, you think this is taking a while, it is. This is a project that I, I really didn't think was going to go very far when I started it. But we wound up working on it for quite a while. I could have stopped it at any time, but it, the, the students got so interested in it, we kept working on it and making it better because they wanted to. They wanted to work on this. And this is a, a preliminary presentation. Each group took turns, they came up, and they presented some of their data, and they got feedback from their peers. And as they're working, you know, there's the issue of understandability, there's the issue of um, comprehensibility, and even in these classes, you know, some of the students, when they're working, they, they have to, you say that again in different ways? And so they need to focus in, and they're focusing on listening and speaking as they're working on this project as well. And these the really interesting things happen in, in, in these projects that I'm doing or I've been doing with my students. And one of the interesting things is they come up with ideas that I never had. And one of the ideas here is that, you know, they said, well, why should, you know, it seems like we're, this data would be a lot more interesting if we had this construction that we were actual members of a company. So they, they formed these companies. I just thought that was brilliant. 
And they, you know, they became the vice president, the president, the media manager. They each took different roles and everybody got really excited. What I loved about this the most is that it was not an idea I had. They came up with it. And you can see their computers are in the room and they're like, they're working on these graphs and they're figuring stuff out. And then it just kept getting better and better and better. Until the day when we practice our presentations and we practiced and practiced and practiced and worked in different ways. We went to separate rooms, we practiced to get it better, and then we went live. We live streamed. We live streamed the presentations. And I asked the students, you know, since we're going to live stream these presentations and it's something real that you've worked on for a long time, why don't you dress up? You know, put on some good clothes. And Let's work on some presentation skills here. And so they did. They were a little concerned about this dressing up for presentations things. But, you know, they came to school that day and they, they looked their best. We did these things on the blackboard and we were live. The fact that we had probably eight people watching doesn't make a bit of difference. They were live streaming. Somebody was manning the camera and it was just fabulous. So. And this is a project. I mean, it started, if you remember a few slides back, it started with nothing. It started with the blackboard. It started with an idea, some students. And before long, live streaming something onto the, and it's no longer my grandmother's classroom. It's just an amazing world, isn't it? I spent a lot of time in class working uh, on goals with students. And I work with university students. And uh, they the students who are 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. They're thinking about the future. They're thinking about what they want to do. And so education, career, interests, all of these things really are something that they're thinking about a lot. They're right in their life all the time. But we all have goals, don't we? We all have things that we, we want to focus on. So I found this is always a good topic to work on. Develop really small projects around. Will there be any test? You're having a test right now. A test in my class, you mean? Well, no. <laughs> I was lucky enough to teach in an environment where I, I really didn't need to, to test. I did portfolio assessments with my students, and uh, I felt that that was the best way for me to do. And at the end of the semesters, I would sit down with, with each of my students, we'd look at their work, and we'd think about, they, they'd reflect on what they did, and I'd ask them questions like, what do you think you could have done better? What, what were you good at? What were you not good at? And so I was lucky enough to be working at this time in an environment where I was able to do that, but you could develop a formal test, I suppose, to work around this. But we did have rubrics. You know, we had rubrics that we worked on on developing together so that students knew what was expected of them. The interesting thing about working in groups is that in a community of, uh, of students who are really becoming close by working on these projects together, they, they, they egg each other on. They, they inspire each other to, to work harder. You know, so they'd see some group come in and who hadn't done really a very good job and they give them a hard time. You know, what? What is this? And th that was a, a really good thing right there. So back to goals anyway. This is one of the projects, one of the early projects I did. And it's something I've done with learners of, of all ages from elementary school right on up to senior citizens and it's something that that works really well it's just an action plan bookmark and it's something that you might want to try in, in some of your classes you can see the little projects right here and if you want to you can do it right now on a piece of paper if you feel like it while you're sitting there in your room wherever in the world you happen to be it's just, what are your goals for, it's not this summer anymore, is it? It's where, whatever season, what are your goals for this season? Think of two things you want to do and, and tell a partner. And so this, this process, you're just really thinking things through and sharing and the, the language is as simple or complex.
complex as you want it to be. I want to buy a mountain bike. I want to go to it. Then you choose one and you think about how you're going to do it. How do you do that? And there's a little language. Well, first I'm going to, then I'm going to, first I'm going to save some money. Then I'm going to find about, out, out about bikes. And after that, I'm going to look for a used bike because I can't afford to buy a brand new mountain bike. And then I'm going to buy my bike. Simple as that. And then you get into groups and you talk about these, pro these goals with each other. And you just use very, very simple language. You should. And give some advice. Well, you know, maybe you should out on the internet. And just sounds great. Good luck. And then you take this bookmark home. And it's an actual bookmark. An actual bookmark that you take home. And it's a project that I've done as I said, in classes of, uh, of all ages, with groups of people of every possible background and language level, and it's always really nice and interesting. Nothing, nothing really technical about it at all. It's a very powerful project because it's personal, but it has a lot of takeaway value. And I'll tell you a little story about this. I was walking across campus one day a couple of years ago, and this guy comes up, this guy I barely remembered, and he goes, Chuck, Chuck, I did it. And I'm thinking, what? What did you do? He goes, I got that car. He's like, what car? He goes, the bookmark. The bookmark. He remembered. His goal was important to him. And I'm sorry I didn't remember, but he did, and he remembered where that goal came from or how he had a chance to share it in the room full of people. But that was an offline project. And so I wanted to get back online and do some different kinds of projects with my students, with my university students. And here's one. We started focusing on jobs, thinking about um, the kinds of jobs that we'd like to, to do. And so I model. I model for my students, and so I made this. It took me about 15 minutes, 20 minutes at home one morning when I was drinking my coffee before I was on my way to class. It's just an A4 sheet of paper with a few things I cut out, and you know, it's my own messy handwriting. It's for my job poster project, and it's true. This is a job that I love to have. I'd read somewhere that you could be the director of storytelling. I think Jace kind of has a job right now. In, in some ways, I do too. But I did some research about it online. I, I took this in the class and I, I told my students about it. I said, well, you know, this is something I'd like to do. And this is the kind of money. And it's, yeah. And this is a good point, Nelly, actually, is that when I, when I model this work for my students, I, I, I am naturally messy. But I actually try to be even a little messier than usual because I don't want them to be spending a lot of time trying to make beautiful things at this point. I just want them to get the right and work like this. So I did this and then I took a picture of it and I put it up on Facebook. If you go to my, my Facebook page today, you'll see that I shared it so that you can see. The next thing I did was was kind of, yeah, any level, sure, why not? You know, what well, you can use for any level. And the language here, you know, you can you can tweak the language so that it could work with low levels, intermediate levels, high levels, any levels. This is probably, well, you know, it could work with, with younger learners uh, as well, thinking about their dreams, about the things that they aspire to be in the future. Why not? This just happened to be with university students. So I took a picture of it and I put it up on my Facebook page. And the next thing I did is I went to Audio Boo. Does anybody know Audio Boo? It's a great site. It's a great tool. Audioboo.com. Also, if you go to my Facebook page today, you can see the Audio Boo I made for this. And it's a short 2.15 minute little presentation I did about this job. Not reading, but talking about this job and why I'd like to, to do it. And I put that up on Facebook as well. And then 
had students get to work. And here's one of the, the posters that students do. And I like this process of really of starting with, again, with pencil, paper, and markers, because it's something people feel really comfortable with, at least in my, my own classes, and maybe in your classes too. But when I come in with a bunch of markers and ideas and paper and I pass it out and I get people working, but you know, they're doing some research online at the same time. She needed to find out this the salary, salary, not salary, sorry, the salary range for um, a photographer. And she needed to find out some other information. I'm getting this document as well. So there's a little bit of tech involved, but not very much here. <clears throat> but then I created a Facebook page for it, a Facebook group. And I've, over the years, past couple of years especially, really come to enjoy working with Facebook groups. I mean, I know a lot of people work in different ways, but Facebook is something that all of my students know that they have access to because they, you know, they're they're teens and, and young adults, so they're there already. I don't need to teach them a, a single thing about it. Sometimes we use the privacy settings on Facebook for Facebook groups, and we have secret groups that only we can see. No one else is allowed in. And we do that for the work that we're not ready to share with the world. And sometimes we create a group like this group here, which is called Five Years, and we invite other people in. If you go to this group, if you click on that link, or you now you can't click on it right now, but if you go to it later, the Facebook page, just go to Facebook and look for the group in five years. I'll let you in and join. There's something like 300 people there from around the world who not always commenting on, but people outside of my class, it was kind of like this really informal, mookish kind of thing started to happen. Didn't even know, we didn't even know, started commenting on students' work. And, you know, of course, I controlled it to make sure there weren't some really strange people in there. But they're all, you know, good people there. And this is um, one of my students. She's using another tool that I, I hope you know about. It's a very simple tool called Screencast-O-Matic, which is very simple to use. We had some real firewall problems at my the university I was working at at, at this time. And uh, Screencast-O-Matic was one of the few tools, along with Audioboo, that we could use. And Screencast-O-Matic is just fabulous because it's absolutely simple to use. And um, here, people were just using the, the camera on the computer to, to do a, a photo of themselves. And then their presentation, what was online, talking about their job, talking about their goal in, in five years. You see, already we're moving from paper and pencil and markers to working on developing some real life speaking and pronunciation and listening skills. What do you think we do when we get everybody's presentations up online? We get the whole class of 25 people, I think, were in that class. The whole class has their projects up online, up in the secret, at that point, the secret Facebook group. They listen to each other, of course. They start commenting on each other. And I say, okay, we've got 15 minutes left in class. We're all on computers, or you've got your iPhone or whatever. I want you to listen to at least patients and comment on it. Comment. How can they be better? And again, this is, this is something that we ended up doing two, three, four, five times until they got it right. And we had some sound issues with this particular project, and so students would try again and again. And they work until they get satisfied. They work until they get comprehensible. And they became very, very good. Good. 
this through saying here after this word, what is that? Can we work on it a little bit? At that point, they go, Chuck, can you help? How do you say inadvertently or whatever the word happens to be? And so we're working on we're working on the, the pronunciation there because they need to, because they need to be comprehensible. And this is something that I found really interesting and I learned. There are, I've done pronunciation work in my, a lot of my classes where we say, okay, here's some pronunciation drills. We're going to work on this. And, um, you know, you, you spend 30 minutes in the class and then nothing, you know, no real learning happens. Because yes, because it is real. Because they want to be understood. They want to get their message out. They want to share. And so I find the pronunciation work we do here as we try to get better is very, very effective. There's me with a probably unnecessary slide showing how I posted this on our Facebook page. And it was a little sample I did showing them how to use um, screencast.com. Let's skip right there, through there. The interesting thing about this project for me, as I said, we got some, well, something like 300 people around the world, students, teachers, and others joining in. And the, here's somebody. Oh, I don't. I have no idea who this is. I think it's a, a, a teacher or a, maybe a student in Russia who was introduced to the group somehow, and suddenly she's doing the homework. She's doing the work in the class, which is really really interesting. And students go in, and you know, there's almost a couple of students who think, you know, uh, yeah, I don't hear my project done. But then they look at the Facebook group and they see that people who are not even in the class, they are somehow inspired or intrigued or, or whatever, they're doing the homework for the class. And I just found this to be fabulous. And it happens with a lot of the groups when we open them up. I've got uh, I've lots of groups I've started with different students for different reasons and different topics. And when, once I open them up, they always get a couple of hundred people, eventually, with the student's permission. And we usually have two groups in class. We have the private group, and then we have a, a group like this one in five years that we opened up for class. I had a, a the class was called Active English or something like that was the title of the course. But we, uh, we kept that group closed for work that we were not ready to present to the world yet. And when we got good, when we got ready, then we opened up, we created new groups and opened those up to other people around the world. And I invited lots of people to join. And I would be remiss if I did not mention this project. And this is a project that I've been involved in for a couple of years. It's an for more than a couple of years. It's a project that tops all projects. And I'd like you to, at some point, take a look at it at uh, the, the link here, Design for Change. It's a very simple process. It was started by one teacher in India in one classroom. And because it's so brilliant and because she had a TED Talk with about a million views, Kiran Bursathi's Design for Change from one school in India has now spread to 35 countries and 24 million children. I'll type into the chat. Kieran Bersethi's name. If you Google her and look for her TED Talk and watch it, you'll see what this is all about. But it's really kids, again, starting with pencil and paper and themselves and ideas and feeling. This feel, this feel step of the project involves thinking about what bothers you. Thank you very much for the, the link. What bothers them? What bothers you? What upsets you? What makes you angry about your community, about your school, about the place where you live? And you walk into class and you bring a big sheet of butcher paper in, you put students in group and you just say, fill the paper up with things that bother you, that you think you'd like, you, things that, that really upset you about your, your community. And they fill up the paper with all kinds of things. Again, this is a, um, a process I, I've worked with in lots of different countries with lots of different students, with lots of different age groups. And I 
never seen a about their community, about their school. Never seen a group of people who cannot fill up a piece of paper with these things. Sometimes I need to encourage them a little bit, but it's incredible. The next step is the imagine step, where students then choose one goal. And how could you fix this thing? How could you fix this thing that, that, that bothers you? And we spend that time with another big sheet of butcher paper. Coming up with some ideas, choosing one problem, focusing on it, and think, how could we fix this? I mean, we're just year olds in, in Bhutan or 14 year olds in Japan or 15 year olds in town. What can we actually do? How can we get people to clean up this neighborhood or, or do something about the, the traffic light that's, that's not there or fix the school or, or clean up the beach or whatever the, the project? Problem has, might, it happens to be. How can we fix that? And then they come up with, again, this is the same thing as the bookmark, really. Come up with an action plan. An action plan. How can we do this? What are we going to do first? And how can we get other people involved? And then this, well, we're going to do it. We're actually going to go out and get, clean, and get involved in cleaning up the river. We're actually going to go out this is something my students at the university did and work at cleaning up the area around the cafeteria. Actually going out doing it. And if you go to the website, you'll see, you'll find links to some incredible stories from around the world where kids become empowered to really change things and, and make a difference. And they do. And then they share it. This is the stop. And this, these are the stories you can find online. And this very simple project, really, that just begins with butcher paper online, has changed the world. I can literally say that it has changed the world. Some of the projects that the kids have done have become ended up policy. In, in Bhutan, for example, kids in Bhutan, a group of kids decided that they would start a campaign to help reduce plastic waste. And once they came up with this this idea that kids will, would only be allowed to bring in um, packaged snacks one day a week. The other days, they would have to um, they just bring stuff from home. No packaging, no plastic at all. And it's a long story, but eventually, the king of Bhutan heard about it, and he made it national policy. Amazing, huh? Just a bunch of kids. And it's, it happens in different places around the world. Incredible. And the, I, the fact that students can share the stories, this is the magic again. They share what they do, they put it up online, and potentially a million people see what they do. And it takes a simple classroom project that could have been done in my grandmother's school, and probably was, and turns it into something world-changing. And that's the magic of the time that we're living in right now. Well, I created a group for you today. And this comes from one of my pre-class tasks for this class. The story of kindness that I shared, and I asked several, I asked people who take me the class to share a story of kindness as well. And I, I saw that many people have done already. And I, I really like the stories that have been shared. And I happen to think that the kinds of projects we work on in, in our classes does have an effect on uh, the way people think and the way people live and the way we, we end up treating each other. So this is a project that I was thinking about for a while, just sharing stories uh, of kindness. So again, I created a Facebook group and because we're all adults and because we are all teachers and I just opened it up to anybody who would like to join. And I hope that everybody here tonight or today hear it.
this morning, wherever it is, time it is. Here, I saw an old man chewing a cart full of fruit across a busy intersection. As he hurried across the street, one of his shoes came off. I saw him look down at his lost shoe, and then up at the traffic coming, and then decide in an instant to leave the shoe behind in order to get his load of fruit to the other side. I was not too far behind him and not in a hurry, so I waited for a break in traffic, went out to get his shoe and brought it to him on the other side. I might add here that it was a shoe for saving. It was a shoe that was almost, was is an old shoe, we'll just say that. But he, it was a shoe that that man needed. When the old man saw me walking up to him with his lost shoe, his face broke into one of the biggest sweetest smiles I've ever seen. He offered me some fruit as a reward. I tried to refuse or at least pay for it, but he insisted. And I finally took it because I didn't speak enough time to tell him that the beautiful smile he gave me was already a sweet reward. That's me reading the story. And I, I created an audio boot uh, uh, for it as, as well. And I, I've posted that on the, the Facebook group, Stories of Kindness Facebook group. And what I haven't told you, though, is that I want you not only to share your stories of kindness, but to retell mine and retell each other's. And you probably notice on Audioboo that there, when you get in there, once you create something, there's, there's a place record a comment and that's a really really interesting feature to work on listening and speaking and storytelling and everything record a comment not only record a comment but also create a new audio boo and post it below post it below the others I haven't done this yet but here you can see the thing that I created today for you and this is the story that I just read to you. There's a picture. I didn't take it. I found it on the internet and I, I sourced it because that's the right thing to do. And there's my audio boo below that, my recording of the old man and the lost shoe. But in a class, what I would like to see people do and what I'd like to see you do is to re start to retell each other's stories. Do both. Do both. Write your own story, of course and record it as well. But as the group starts to develop, what I would like to see happen is for us retelling other people's stories. And what I thought would be interesting is if we start, read the story a couple of times, two or three times, and then you internalize it and retell it maybe without reading it. Retell the story because it's pretty easy to do. And you can tell it in the first person, the third person, or the third person, whatever way you'd like to do it. But when I do this, and you know, I start getting people to start retelling other people's stories, some really interesting things happen. So we'll see if they happen on this Facebook page for this class as well. So there's that. This is going to be part of your post-class assessment, or post-class task, rather. There'll be a little more. But we'll see how this develops, and we'll uh, experiment with it. And uh, part of the post, the the post class task will be reflecting on this whole process and thinking about how we could do it better. Then I'll, you'll have time. I know you'll have time. Where's the guys <laughs> that as Dr. Nelly? So we're coming up on the hour. But I'd like to remind you. Something that you already know, that every teacher has a story, every single one, and that one of the very, very important things that we can do for each other is to listen to our stories. Jason mentioned a little bit at, about my work with ITDI at the beginning of class around the world in the ITDI platform and out of the world in blended learning courses. Five minutes I got. Okay. And you can see a lot of the people there. I know that some of the people are, are in the room. 
If you sign up for an ITDI account, you will be able to listen and read and share your stories there. We're just winding things up. You'll want to, it's absolutely free to sign up. Jason's about to talk, and I'm going to move to the last you slide. You didn't. There you go. You notice I gave you 10 more minutes there. Uh, I you did. Well, yeah. I, I definitely um, want people to have a chance to do a little Q&A with you and for you to talk about ITDI a little bit because there's a... Oh, sure. We're in a very special uh, forum right here because we've got all these great English teachers everywhere, and what you do is of particular interest, I think. Too. Oh, thanks. So, Thank yeah, you very much. If, could, if people could have that opportunity, if you don't mind. Oh, I know. I'd, I'd love to. Yeah. All righty. <laughs> I'm disappearing again. Oh, thanks. <laughs> all right. Well, i got 10 more minutes to answer questions. Thank you very much for everybody for coming. That was, that was the, pr the presentation, and now we're in, in free form. Here, and I'm happy to answer questions. I'll go back and show you this slide again. But ITDI stands for International Teacher Development Institute. It um, was founded by myself along with Barbara Hassan Sakamoto and Steve Herder, and Scott Thornberry, and a number of incredible people. And uh, we found that there are a lot of teachers around the world who don't, who don't for a number of reasons, have access to professional development. They work in areas in the world where they're still unconnected or they don't think they're people who connected, that they're not quite worthy of joining the international com teacher community that we're all involved in here tonight and online. And so we work with teachers around the world and we are, are we're all in it together. There's no real hierarchy. All some of the people involved on the faculty and in the mentors and in the associates of ITDI are, yes, you are, Nina, you are ITDI, are just some of the most amazing people working in this field. We are all in it together. I'd love you to be involved, Dr. Nelly. And here is the way to sign up for our This has nothing to do with the class that we just taught. But it's another way to share and grow uh, as teachers. There's Twitter, and we have a, a Facebook account uh, as well. But <clears throat> the way to get involved in ITDI is just to ask. And we'll, we'll, we got a lot of work to do. And uh, we are a, a teacher-funded business. We are not funded by any publishers or corporations around the world, but we have 50 investors who have launched this site. And we have um, two courses we are running all the time uh, online. One is called English for Teachers, and another one is called just Teacher Development. And they're designed for people who really have not taken um, or had a lot of opportunity for professional development. And you would not be surprised to know that probably, I'm not going to give you a percentage, but a great number of teachers, thousands and thousands, and even millions in the, in the world, they have, do not have a degree, do not have um, professional development, or haven't for whatever reason. And so we've made it available for them at no cost, very, 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 very low cost as well. So that's that's ITDI, and again, you can see that we just have people from around the world working with us, and our, we also have a blog that we we publish every week. And in this coming year, we're going to be launching um, a series of short courses by some great people around the world. Just stay tuned for that. And we'd love to have you involved. At the very least, sign up for an account and um, have a look at, at what we do. I, I came back in just because I wrote down a few questions on the way. OK. And what, what we could do with the last 10 minutes here. I'm glad you talked about ITDI because I really Thank you. really think people 
here. And remember, a lot of people are going to be watching this recording asynchronously later, so it's, it's really important. So go check it out. Uh, I, a few questions. One is, uh, where are you from originally? You said you're in Japan now. A couple people asked about that. I almost forgot, but I'm, I'm, from, I'm originally from Western New York State around Niagara Falls, and um, I grew up in a very small town there. Okay, cool. And uh, another question was, uh, when you were talking about the project stuff you're doing, um, uh -huh. someone, someone asked, um, do you stop students and correct them? And, and this is very interesting, I think. To uh, for a lot of student-driven stuff, you get them engaged in different ways. They take it to different levels, and you're not teaching uh, you know, the grammar points. They're they're getting it along the way. What about with errors, especially pronunciation? What do you any any idea? What, what do you do with that? I stop them and correct them. You know, and and, and um, gently, you know, gently. I don't say, okay, class, we're going to stop this because we got an error over here now. But you know, when when I hear one. When I hear a pronunciation, I stop. You know, I write down the word, and I do a you know a tap on tap on the shoulder, uh -huh. that old a bit old technique, and I say, "Listen to this," you know. Or can you, or here we're working in a group here. You know, somebody's just given their presentation, and I get some feedback from the other students and get other people involved in, in, in the correction. And what I find with these projects that's really interesting is that students want to get it right. You know, they, they want to be understood because they're trying to say something mm -hmm. that's real and, and, and important for them. So, yeah, by all means. And when we cannot get to, and the students understand this from the beginning, we cannot get to the right. You know, so, yeah, correction does happen. We can't go up online with um, a lot of pronunciation errors and grammar errors. So we work to make sure that's right. Well, I think yeah. one thing I just wanted to add, all that, the stuff you're talking about, audio boo and all that stuff, it's such such amazing opportunities to listen again and, you know, it doesn't have to be, oh, right this second, you're correct, you know, you, there, there's these opportunities to share, consider errors at whatever time you want to. I mean, this is where technology, what I think is so great about what you're talking about yeah. today. It's a really good, um, really good point. You know, it's, it's just it's just enabling people to do more real life. We're just all of the time. You know, it's like we separated. We didn't. We never wanted to separate real life from uh, what we're doing in you know community of language teaching. It's just we. It's pretty hard when you're in a closed desks and books <laughs> to try to bring the real life in. Well, now there's no excuse anymore. You know, now no. it's it's right there. So it's it's just so so cool. And as I said, it's it, it's it's in pockets. But what you what you say yep. about um, uh, assessment and in being able to work at any time when you know students put all of these things in, the, in their portfolios and we sit down and we talk about the stuff you know all students have errors that come up they're, they're individual but they're, they're consistent in them and I can have them reflect on the errors they're making and we can each we can develop a little plan for the, for them to fix those things so it work, it's much more effective than, you know, when I used to be this sort of teacher who stood up in front of the classroom and here's the book and, you know, here's the lesson for today. Three people get it, 28 people don't. So this works a lot better, I think. Cool. Uh, a few more minutes. Let's get some other questions here, if you have any. I have a couple. So if I don't see yours, I'll ask mine. But I'm more curious to see when else has a question here. Chuck, what's the most advice your grandmother ever gave you? If you were here at the beginning, Chuck talked about uh, his, his wonderful mentor and his and his grandmother, who was a teacher, and he showed a picture of the, the one room schoolhouse. Chuck, most important advice. This is a true story. When she was about ninety seven years old, she was laying in a bed. It was probably one of the last times I ever saw her, and uh, I went in to say good night to her. She had an amazing memory, even at this time. She had, she had lost a lot, but she. She recited some things for me. So one of the things was Chaucer that she remembered from her university days. And she told me a couple of stories. And then she looked at me and she said, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. She said, always listen to your students. Sometimes they don't use words, but they'll tell you the truth. They speak with their heart. And it's like, yeah. I, I wrote it in a blog post somewhere, but she told me that, and um, she was, it was interesting. My grandmother, 
she was a person who's probably one of the um, people that influenced me most in, in my life. And uh, she was a really interesting person. She was the only person who ever in my family, until me, went to college. And the fact that she did so at the beginning of the 20th century was an amazing thing. But yeah, listen to your students. Sometimes they won't speak words, but they'll tell you what they need in their heart, with their heart. I recently wrote a post again, again about her, and uh, she, she comes up a lot in, in my writing. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I wrote about uh, the people who came to her funeral, who were, by that time, And you have senior citizens themselves who still talked about the things they learned. Really cool. Sure, you can quote on Facebook. <laughs> well, S Sylvia's got lots of plans, I think, to uh, to keep connected. Well, what 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 Dr. Nelly's saying here is is almost sort of rhetorical because she knows we are we are getting together in one place, um, and it's it's just happening on its own, which is what's so great about. Uh, just opening things up as, as you're talking about here today. Once once we're connected and open, it's kind of just we'll gravitate, <laughs> like-minded people uh, gravitating and, and getting stronger as we share more and more of our ideas. Uh, it's just it's just fantastic. It, Another question? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, mm -hmm. please. No, you go ahead. <laughs> no, I, you I go. was just gonna I, I was gonna rattle on with something. But you go ahead if there's a question. <laughs> oh, I'm good for rattling on, as everybody here knows. David's asking, how can we extend learning beyond the classroom? How can we extend learning beyond the classroom? Well, this is the man uh, to ask this question to for sure. So We just did. <laughs> <laughs> but how about another example, maybe? Or how about, yeah, but if, you, if maybe David hasn't been here the whole time. David, you watch watch this, uh, this amazing class, and you're going to see all kinds of, because that's what we talked about. Um, but go ahead, uh, Chuck. You have so many different ideas. What's something I, I just... Yeah. Any time, any time we can, we can really. I think the goal these days is to break down the classroom walls. And as Jason was saying, the, the technology that's that's available to us now is um, just awe-inspiring. So even if it's just you know, you, you students are doing some little project in class, you take a picture of it with a phone, you post it on Facebook. Right there, you've taken learning outside of the classroom. You connect with another group of students around the world who are doing something, you, you get on Twitter and you find another teacher who's doing something similar to what you're doing, you get students collaborating with each other, learning is outside the classroom. You know, you, you form, yeah, so and it's, it's just... In any way, it's the thing, it's like, you know, it, it sounds like cliche, you know, but, but like, you know, you either, you, you what, what is the cliche I'm looking for? You know, if you can't beat them, join them or something, but, you know, the students, the whole, like, the whole notion of put away your cell phones, you know, put away the world outside the classroom. It's just, it's going to be almost comical in a few years from now in teacher uh, training programs, you know, of, of putting away, you know, the connection to the world. Uh, so we're in this transition, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, gathering here, we're, we're pioneering so many things. And I did want to come in and say the quote, because you said breaking down the door. So I had this thing in 2013, online learning is no fluke. Tear the doors off the classrooms, make way for the moves. So, there you go. <laughs> you know, make it's, way it's, it's coming anyway. You know what I mean? So let's let's shape it and make it communicative. Let's make these 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 experiences connect and it's social. Just, uh, it's an amazing time to be a teacher and an amazing time to be a learner. And we're we really really have the years. And I I know that twenty years from now people are going to look back and go you <laughs> with what audio boo. Right, right. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. We, 45 really? Seconds, 45 seconds, and I want to be able to say thank you so much to Chuck Sandy uh, and to everyone here for, for coming and participating so actively today. It was it was really fantastic. I had high hopes for this, and uh, wow, I'm really excited to watch it again. I had, I had, a, <laughs> I'm gonna I had a great time. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Good. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everybody. Jacqueline Smith, yes, I know, I know who you are working with Leslie Painter. I am going to come come visit you guys soon. Uh, goodbye to Olga in Mexico. Adrian, I forgot where you're from. Dimitris, Club EFL in Greece. Charles Goodger, Action uh, fun, fun Songs. Yay, who else? <laughs> oh, we got to go. We're running out of time. Enjoy the rest of the